for the administration to consider S-4573, the Electoral Count Reform and Presidential Transition Improvement Act. First, I want to thank my good friend, uh, Ranking Member Blunt, uh, for his leadership uh, and his friendship and for joining me in introducing the bipartisan manager's amendment that we will consider today. Um, from the beginning of our work together when Senator Blunt was the chair uh, to now uh, when I am the chair, uh, we have strived uh, for bipartisanship and um, this is the ultimate example of that um, as we have a lot of support for this bill. Now, I want to make clear uh, that this is also uh, the work of Senator Collins and Manchin um, and the group of senators um, that uh, worked painstakingly for months uh, to come to an agreement on this bill and on this committee that includes Senator Warner, who's with us today, as well, who has a you know, sense of history in his state, uh, as well as Senator Capito. Um, and we, we thank both of them for their work on the bipartisan group uh, that drafted the bill before us. And I also appreciate their support as well as um, Senator Manchin and Senator Collins' support for the manager's amendment. Finally, I want to recognize our good friend Senator King uh, for his early, early leadership on this issue. He was ahead of his time, as always, um, and uh, drafted legislation that he and I and Senator Durbin introduced in February, and a number of the provisions in that draft bill are, uh, have stood the test of time and are included uh, in uh, both the Senate and House versions of this effort. Uh, we are here today after months of bipartisan efforts, as I noted, to find common ground on needed reforms to the outdated and antiquated Electoral Count Act. I appreciate the work of my colleagues and input we've received from experts, including an incredibly productive hearing last month. I hope this bipartisan markup will continue in that spirit, and I note that at the hearing, many of the ideas that were raised at the hearing are now in the manager's amendment. Enacted in 1887 after the disputed election between Rutherford Hayes and Samuel Tilden, the Electoral Count Act was largely overlooked for over 130 years. But it was at the center of a plan to overturn the 2020 election and the will of the American people that, as we all know, who work here, culminated in a violent mob desecrating the Capitol. On that day, enemies of our democracy sought to use this antiquated law to subvert the results of a free and fair election. They did this by making false claims that this law allowed the vice president to refuse to accept electoral votes that were lawfully cast by recruiting state legislators to declare a failed election and appoint their own electors, and by exploiting the fact that the law allows one single senator and one single representative to object to the state's electoral votes and use baseless uh, claims to delay the count in Congress. And I will note uh, that this could happen. Either party could decide to have one person object or another person object, and we could literally have a delay, as Senator Blunt and I know from um, looking at this leading into January 6th, that could go on for day or days and days. I will never forget being there with you, Senator Blunt, and Vice President Pence at 3.30 in the morning as we walked through the broken glass and the spray-painted columns to do our job. It was silent, a stark contrast to the morning's celebratory walk uh, with members of the Senate. While we finished our work that day, the peaceful transfer of power which lies at the very foundation of our democracy was at stake. And it's essential that we come together to take action to ensure that it never happens again. This bill explicitly rejects once and for all the false claims that the vice president has authority to accept or reject electoral votes and makes it clear that the vice president's role during the joint session is ceremonial. Second, it raises the threshold to challenge the electoral votes during the joint session of Congress to guard against baseless claims. Right now, just two people out of 535 members can object and slow down and gum up the counting. This bill would raise the threshold to one-fifth of Congress. Third, it ensures that partisan state legislatures cannot appoint electors themselves and ignore the will of the voters. Fourth, it makes reforms to ensure that candidates uh, can have an appeal process. 
Finally, I will add that while this bill is introduced includes vital reforms that guard against future threats to our democracy, the manager's amendment, which we will consider shortly, includes key improvements to build on the bipartisan's work and has been accepted by the leaders and the members of that group. Today we have an opportunity to take strong bipartisan action to protect the cornerstone of our democracy, the peaceful transfer of power. I look forward to advancing this critical legislation in this committee and continuing to work with our colleagues in both chambers of Congress to pass these reforms into law uh, by the end of the year so that nothing like the chaos of January 6 ever happens again. I now recognize my friend Senator Blunt for his opening statement. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman and uh, Club Chair. It's um, good to work with you on the issues we do on the daily activities of the Senate, but also to work on this bill and for holding the mark up today. I'm glad our colleagues are here. I think even more of our colleagues will attend, uh, understanding that this is uh, one of the more important things we're likely to address this year. Uh, it's already have had since January the 6th, really a lengthy discussion that now has lasted almost two years about the Electoral Count Act of 1887. That's governed Congress's electoral counting process for 135 years, but as we found out last year, it's uh, vague, uh, outdated, and needed reform. There's been broad support on both sides of the aisle to update the act, to clarify the language, and address the ambiguities in the act. There's also been broad agreement that any changes to the process by which Congress counts electoral votes should be bipartisan. For the better part of the, of the past year, as you pointed out, a bipartisan group of senators led by Senator Collins and Senator Manchin have worked uh, to craft the Electoral Count Reform and Presidential Transition Improvement Act. Uh, they talked to many election experts and legal scholars and engaged in Robust, robust debate of how the Electoral Count Act should be reformed. The result of their work is a bill that's already received significant support from senators of both sides of the aisle. I want to applaud that group for their efforts. And as you mentioned, two of our committee members, Senator Capito and Senator Warner, were really involved in that conversation. You and I were supportive of letting that bipartisan uh, group uh, do its work. Uh, they negotiated this bipartisan bill. Uh, that type of deliberation and debate and compromise is exactly how the Senate is supposed to work. Uh, with any compromise, no one's likely to be completely happy with the final result, but this bill addresses and fixes the major flaws of the Electoral Count Act. Uh, it clarifies the role of the Vice President and Congress during the Electoral Count itself. It raises the threshold required to levy an objection and ensures a single senator and single representative may not dispute the counting uh, process or disrupt the counting process. It, place, it replaces the undefined and controversial failed election clause and ensures states can't overturn the results of an election. It provides for an expedited federal court process to ensure state issues uh, certifications after the election has been certified in their state. Uh, in August, the Rules Committee held what I thought was a very productive hearing to discuss the reform process and ask questions about the bill. Uh, since then, uh, Chairwoman Klobuchar and I have worked with Senator Collins and Manchin as well as the, as the rest of the bipartisan group to draft our manager's amendment to address some issues uh, raised at the hearing, and they further strengthen the bill. Uh, we were able to do this in relatively short order thanks to the working group's hard work and the dedication that they had in drafting the bill to start with. We also had an opportunity to review the work passed by the House last week and think that the amendments that we were working on are sometimes reflective of some differences in the House bill and this bill. I'm hopeful that this markup will move the bill forward in the same constructive bipartisan spirit uh, that's been drafted in. I look forward to the conversation today and sending this bill to the full Senate. Thank you. We've been joined by Senator McConnell. Please, please give us some words. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm um, pleased that we are where we are today. Um, we are here to consider legislation that is 
<clears throat> necessarily detailed and complex, but the reason we're here is pretty simple. After 150 years, the Electoral Count Act needs some modest updates. Those of us on the committee know it. I believe that all our colleagues in the Senate know it, and the American people certainly know it. Now, clearly, when a 150-year-old law has successfully brought us certainty, finality, and one orderly presidential inauguration after another, we need to be delicate and careful with any changes. But the chaos that came to a head on January 6 of last year strongly suggests that we find careful ways to clarify and streamline the process. And so does what happened actually in January of 2001, January of 2005, and January of 2017. For more than 20 years now, every time voters pick a Republican president, we've seen at least some Democrats in Congress resist the people's decision and try to challenge the electoral count. So the situation obviously called for careful, methodical, and bipartisan work to arrive at a careful, methodical, and bipartisan product. It's clear that only a bipartisan compromise originating in the Senate can actually become law. One party going it alone would be a non-starter. In my view, the House bill is a non-starter. We have one shot to get this right, and fortunately for all of us, fortunately for the country, an outstanding working group of senators rolled up their sleeves. I especially want to thank Senator Collins for her leadership, Senator Blunt for his commitment to the process. Senators Capito, Murkowski, Portman, Romney, Sass, Tillis, and Young were also instrumental on our side of the aisle. Obviously, their Democratic counterparts worked hard to make this happen as well. I strongly support the Collins legislation as introduced, and assuming that we make no changes here today, or at the most technical changes, I'll be proud to vote for it and to help advance it. The substance of this bill is common sense. It's common sense to modestly increase, as others have said here, uh, the threshold for objections to the electoral count so that Congress still has options in case of a truly extraordinary circumstance. But we avoid an arms race where objections with almost no support paralyze the process every four years. It's common sense to make the already clear fact of the 12th Amendment even clearer still, that the Vice President obviously has no personal discretionary power over the presidential vote. It is common sense to protect states' primacy in appointing their electors, but also strengthen requirements that states publicize their rules before the elections and stick to them. It's common sense to make technical fixes to other related laws like the Presidential Transitions Act. And it's common sense that our colleagues left chaos generating bad ideas on the cutting room floor, like the massive federal takeover of election law or inventing new causes of action for litigation that would throw every election into the courts. The legislation before us with this text in this form is Congress one option to get an outcome. And in my view, this is not an opportunity we should pass up. So in closing, I want to again thank my colleagues for their weeks and weeks of hard work on this. Let's preserve the legislation as introduced and report out this important bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Senator McConnell. Um, I'm going to introduce the um, manager's amendment, and then I know we have some um, number of members want to make comments, but I thought it would be good to get moving on that, and you can talk about that or anything else. Um, with these opening statements being concluded, we will move on to today's agenda. Uh, the committee will now proceed to consideration of four five, S4573. Uh, the Electoral Count Reform and Presidential Transition Improvement Act. I call up the manager's amendment in the nature of a substitute that Senator Blunt and I are co-leading, uh, and I recognize myself to speak on the amendment. This manager's amendment um, is truly bipartisan. 
uh, Senator Blunt and I jointly drafted and filed it, and all the changes in it are supported by Senator Collins and Manchin and the other members of the group. Um, and, and I appreciate um, Senator McConnell's words about the importance of that group and the work that they did and the recognition of their work. I also want to thank all the experts from both parties who gave feedback on the legislation, including elected officials like Minnesota Secretary of State Steve Simon. At our hearing last month, all the witnesses, Republicans and Democrats, agreed that we must update the Electoral Count Act to ensure the will of the voters prevails in future presidential elections. They also all expressed support for improvements to make sure the bill works the way it was intended. The manager's amendment will implement those changes. First, this is the management, manager's amendment. It protects against political gamesmanship by ensuring elections can only be extended in true emergencies and not for partisan reasons. We do that by adding language to clarify that only truly unforeseen emergencies qualify as extraordinary and catastrophic events that allow a state to extend voting in a presidential election. Second, it clarifies that a court can compel a governor to certify the correct electors and prevent a partisan official from overturning the will of the voters. Third, it makes sure that the expedited judicial review process doesn't preempt election cases that candidates and voters can bring under existing laws to defend their rights. Fourth, it will help prevent unnecessary Supreme Court decisions that would create uncertainty in elections by allowing the court to grant or deny review. There is general agreement on the committee that the court should make its own decisions about whether or not it takes up cases. Fifth, it requires governors to immediately transmit certificates of electors to the archivist of the United States, which will increase transparency by ensuring the certificates are publicly available sooner. The updates in the manager's amendment uh, are improvements that were supported by all involved that will help protect our presidential elections and strengthen our democracy. And while there are additional changes that I know some will like to see to the bill, we may hear about a few today, uh, these are provisions, the original bill as well as the manager's amendment that will achieve a strong bipartisan consensus and we should be very proud of this bill. I thank Senator Blunt again for his work on this manager's amendment. I urge our colleagues to join us in supporting it. Senators, want to are we going to have any comments about this? Well, I, I just say, Chairwoman, that we listened carefully to the witnesses we had at the hearing. Uh, we made changes that were consistent with what the bipartisan group did. Uh, and there were a couple of places where we simply didn't try to go back and um, have all of the um, debates that they'd taken to arrive at a couple of areas where they clearly felt that this got them to where they could present the bill they presented. It solves the problems we want to solve. Uh, and I am fully in support of the ma manager's amendment you and I have put together. Okay, very good. I think we had some requests before. I know I see you, Senator Padilla, but Senator Warner, King Padilla. So we'll start with Warner, then we'll go. I know Senator Cruz and Senator uh, uh, Capito. Well, thank you, Mr. Uh, Madam Chairman. I want to um, acknowledge what you all have indicated that this, you know, some of this seems pretty simple, but I can tell you the bipartisan group, and it was a broad bipartisan group. This was not a small gang. This was 20 plus senators that met literally for weeks on end. Uh, I think there is, as Leader McConnell said, enormous complexity in this, and I think we did um, spend a lot of time trying to get it right, uh, number one. Number two, I really appreciate you and uh, Ranking Member Blunt not feeling that you had to reinvent the wheel the way some committees would because the product didn't necessarily originate with the, the chair and the ranking member. And I think that uh, approach, I'm, I'm grateful to both of you. I also would echo what Senator Blunt said, that I think your hearing you had was, was really helpful. And I remember one of the witnesses that while we had technical changes, those changes I think were extraordinarily important. So I think we have come to a very, very good product. Um, the art of compromise is not getting all you want. Uh, I, I want to point out two things from my colleagues that I hope we could uh, revisit uh, at, at some point. One is something that would clearly fall within the jurisdiction of this committee. 
uh, and I've not pitched Senator Blunt on this or Senator King on this, but both as members of the Intel Committee, I think would realize how important uh, we need to have some level of de minimis cybersecurity standards for our voting machines. Right now, we have standards to make sure that if they are you know, put in a bad weather situation, um, that they can st withstand a storm, um, but not that they can withstand a cyber attack. And uh, nothing would be uh, partisan or anything else on that, but in terms of really making a 21st century election system safe, uh, I, I would hope we could come back and at some later point look at those de minimis cybersecurity standards um, uh, for our voting machines. Second, which would be a little bit outside this committee, but I work closely with Senator Portman and Senator Sinema on trying to make sure that the, um, the Postal Service in the weeks and months before an election don't put a thumb on the scale uh, to make sure that uh, uh, that mail-in in voting is done in a way where voters know that uh, that mail is going to be treated as first class, it's going to be treated in an appropriate way. That again will probably be more the, the, the responsibility of, the, of his GAC, um, but I think both improvements could be made. But in the spirit of, of uh, the gang and your good work on rules, we'll have to revisit those uh, on another day, but um, I do think the, the working group did a good product and again want to appreciate uh, uh, the chair and the ranking members and all the members of the Rules Committee for coming up with what I think was a very sensible manager's amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Warner. Uh, Senator Cruz. Thank you, Madam Chair. This bill is a bad bill. This bill is bad law, it's bad policy, and it's bad for democracy. There are serious constitutional questions in the bill. The text of the Constitution, Article 2, says each state shall appoint in such matter as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors. This bill is Congress trying to intrude on the authority of the state legislatures to do that. But it's also exceptionally bad policy. Unfortunately, I understand why Democrats in this body support it. I think there are three reasons Democrats in this body support it. Number one, this bill is all about Donald J. Trump. And nobody in our lifetimes has driven Democrats in this body more out of their mind than President Trump. We know that Democrats aren't opposed to objecting to elections and presidential electors. We know that because Democrats objected in 1969, and then they objected again in 2001, and then they objected again in 2005, and then they objected again in 2017. So Democrats have a long history of going up and objecting to electors. And by the way, in two of those times, 1969 and 2005, it wasn't just a Democrat House member that objected, a Democrat senator joined in that objection and triggered the debate and vote. We also know the brazen hypocrisy that the democratic rage at Trump has produced where we have a kangaroo circus of a January 6th committee literally chaired by a House Democrat who made one of those objections, insisting that it is now utterly unimaginable to object to a presidential election and to the outcomes thereof. We also know that the Democrats are hell-bent on federalizing elections, and this bill takes a significant step down that road of putting the federal government in charge of elections. That has been a top Democrat priority for some time. But the biggest reason this bill is problematic is it is intended to decrease the ability of the United States Congress to address the very real problem of voter fraud. Voter fraud has been a persistent challenge in our elections from the dawn of time. Democrats used to acknowledge that. That didn't used to be a controversial statement until suddenly the 2020 election when Democrats began clutching their pearls and insisting there is no voter fraud, it never has happened, and anyone who says it does happen is wearing a tinfoil hat and is a moonbat conspiracy theorist. That is wildly dishonest, I believe. And indeed, you can see in the Democrats' effort to pass the Corrupt Politicians Act, S-1, that the Democrat Party today has made a decision that voter fraud is affirmatively in its political interest. The Corrupt Politicians Act would strike down every photo ID law in the country despite the fact that overwhelming supermajorities of Americans support photo ID for voting. The Corrupt Politicians Act would strike down laws in, in states across this country prohibiting ballot harvesting even though 
Former Democratic President Jimmy Carter told us ballot harvesting is one of the greatest avenues for voter fraud you can have. The Corrupt Politicians Act would register millions of felons to vote and would register millions of illegal aliens to vote. And yet, unfortunately, today's Democrats have made, I think, a really cynical political decision that voter fraud, they believe, helps elect more Democrats, and so the more fraud, the better. What this bill does is decreases the ability of Congress to address instances of fraud when it occurs, and I believe Congress has a responsibility to do that. I would note that in the election of 1876, when there were serious allegations of voter fraud, Congress did not throw its hands in the air and say there's nothing we can do about it. No, Congress appointed what it called an election commission that consisted of five senators, five House members, five Supreme Court justices that examined the facts and evidence of voter fraud and made a determination. That incident became the predicate for what is now the Electoral Count Act. That was responding responsibly. What this bill is trying to do is take Congress out of the business of trying to correct fraud. Now, as I said, I understand why Democrats are supporting this bill. What I don't understand is why Republicans are. In the House, the House version, Lofgren-Cheney, it did ostensibly get nine Republican votes, all from Republicans who are either not running for re-election or who were beaten in their primaries. In other words, not a single Republican who actually is going before the voters is willing to support it. I don't believe senators from this side of the aisle should be supporting a bill that enhances the federalization of elections and reduces the ability of Congress to respond to the very serious problem of voter fraud. I think this bill does that, and so I intend to oppose it. All right. Uh, next up, uh, Senator King. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I would just point out that uh, this bill is not a, a bill that comes out of the blue, but is in fact a modification of a 150-year-old law that's already been on the books. It's not a new effort of Congress to intrude into, into the electoral process. It's merely intended to clarify a law, which virtually everyone that's discussed it over the past 25 years has agreed is archaic and confusing. And uh, it doesn't take Congress out of the business of, uh, uh, it, it doesn't uh, eliminate Congress's ability to look at any aspect of elections. It just says one or two people can't do it. It has to be a more, a broader, basis uh, for objection, 20% of, of, uh, of each house. Uh, I have two amendments to propose, and then I will withdraw. I want to I outline what they are. One of them is, uh, in, in current law, the, uh, the, the, the basis of an objection is the vote of one or more electors has not been <laughs> regularly given. That's the law. That's the language from the old, ancient law. That's a term that <laughs> is not very well defined and is confusing and the scholars recommend that we change that to is unlawful or the product of unlawful co coercion. It's merely a clarification of a term that really has no legal meaning. The second uh, proposed amendment is even simpler and that is uh, that we've, we're talking about uh, where a court will have an opportunity to in effect referee these conflicts and uh, the, the current law, the, the, the current statute says, such action shall be heard by a district court of three judges, convened, et cetera. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do with this statute is to clarify and restore the trust of the American people. And my suggestion is simply to add the phrase, assigned on a random basis, in order to prevent forum shopping by either party. It's impossible to predict as the as the major as the Republican leader pointed out, Democrats in the past have gone through this process of objecting one or two objections here or there, and as the senator from Texas points out, uh, a, a Democratic senator joined so that we had this process. So I think that assigned on a random basis, rather than uh, a kind of opportunity for forum shopping, would again be a, a technical change, but which would uh, increase the. Uh, public confidence in the result that uh, there wasn't gamesmanship going on in trying to uh, select which judges should be hear the, uh, hear the appeal. So having made those uh, two proposed amendments, I, I hereby withdraw them. 
uh, reserving the right to bring them forward uh, in a future consideration of this matter. I also want to compliment uh, the chair and the ranking member for the amazing work that they've done on this, on this bill, as well as the bipartisan group uh, who recognized a danger to our democracy from an archaic, confusing, and uh, uh, abstract law and to improve it, not to, not to radically change it, but to improve it so that it meets the needs of the 21st century and will apply to both parties, any parties, any candidate in the future. That's what this bill is all about. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator King. As well said as the independent senator could say, uh, I think that's a really important thing to note that we don't know who's going to win elections in the future, but both Democrats and Republicans felt it was important to uh, take a law that hadn't been updated for a long time um, and make it work for our democracy. Um, and I would also note before we turn to uh, Senator Capito that uh, this Back to 1876, you and I discussed this before, Senator Cruz, uh, this disputed election. Um, it is not my favorite precedent that time because I wouldn't have even been allowed to vote. Um, and um, I think it's just an example um, that election was such a mess and it's why Congress did enact the Electoral Count Act and we're simply looking at how do we make this work regardless of what party wins an election so that the will of the people uh, will in fact uh, dictate the outcome. So with that, I turn it over to Senator Capito. Thank you for thank your you. work on the bipartisan group. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Ranking Member Blunt, for having uh, scheduling this business meeting to consider a bill that I am proud, as a Republican, to have worked on and is important, I think, to strengthen our process. And I think the manager's amendment strengthens it as well. I would note that in the process that we went through with Senator Warner and certainly under the leadership of Senators Collins and Senator Manchin, um, we took our time on this to the frustration of a lot of people. There was a restlessness to say, are you going to do anything? Are you not going to do anything? Are you going to go far enough? Are you going to go, are you going to go too narrow? And I think we, at one point we were at five points. Now we're down to what? One and a half of those five is what this bill uh, consists on. So uh, we crafted it with, a, uh, with common sense solutions to a, re a problem. Members of Congress on both sides, as Senator Cruz pointed out, have sought to use the Electoral co uh, College certification process to overturn the results of elections that they may not like. So I've long championed our decentralized electoral systems. That's what we have, which gives states the powers to design and enforce their election laws to meet the needs of their constituents. Can't, we can't vote the same way you do in Texas and West Virginia, I don't think, and we shouldn't. Because of this, I do not believe that members of Congress should, lawfully, should overturn lawfully, and I say lawfully, cast votes. This is why I proudly joined the working group and strongly support our bipartisan legislation. The Electoral Count Reform and President Transition Improvement Act is a result of months of careful de deliberation and debate. Our group welcomed all kinds of input from legal experts, from this committee, from individuals, from constitutional uh, scholars, from all different types of political leanings. And based on that information, we came up with this bill. From the beginning, it was clear if we were ever going to get bipartisan support, we had to draft a very narrow bill, as, as the leader has said. And I understand that this legislation may not encompass all or may encompass maybe too much, but let me be clear, it is very carefully and narrowly crafted. So I would urge my colleagues and, and my counterparts in the House to look at this business seriously. It's meaningful, it's tailored, it clarifies the certification process. And I will continue to push for the passage of this legislation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Very good, thank you, Senator Capito. Uh, Senator Padilla, former Secretary of State, thank you for being here. Thank you, along with uh, Senator Blunt, one of the two former State Secretaries of State on this panel. Um, Madam Chair, last week I was uh, pleased to join as a co-sponsor of the Electoral Count Reform Act. Uh, and I wanna speak briefly as to why I'm supporting it here today. The Electoral Count Act reform is critical to ensuring the peaceful, excuse me, the process of certifying future presidential elections as well as the peaceful transfer of power that's so fundamental to our democracy, ensuring that those two processes are not disrupted as they were last January 6th. 
So as we take this uh, next step in the legislative process, I too want to thank all the members involved in crafting this bipartisan bill because I'm mindful that this isn't just another vote at another markup. This vote is about living up to our oath of office. When we were each sworn in, we swore to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. And that includes working to ensure that an insurrection, an attack on our democracy, never happens again. So I'm committed to uh, building the necessary support for this bill in the Senate, I'm committed to reaching out to our colleagues in the House, and I'm committed to doing the work to get this bill to the President's desk for a signature. But I also note that as important as it is to fix the outdated Electoral Account Act, as you mentioned, Madam Chair, as California's former Secretary of State, I know that this isn't the only part of our election system that needs updating. Across the country, too many Americans still experience unnecessary obstacles to exercising their right to vote. And election workers who are on the front lines of administering our democracy are increasingly facing threats and harassment for simply doing their job. We must do better. So as urgent and as important as it is to pass the Electoral Account Reform Act now, I urge all of us to build on the bipartisan effort at the center of this markup here today and to come together to fully update our election system to protect our election workers, to secure the fundamental right to vote, and to make it easier for all eligible Americans, Republican, Democrat, and Independent, to participate in our democracy. So uh, thank you again to my colleagues for coming together today to strengthen our democratic process. But may this first step, an important step, but let it be just a first step to further protecting the voices of millions of Americans. And with that, I do urge uh, all of us to vote for the substitute and when adopted, full, vote for the bill as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Padilla. And I believe you have a statement for the record. Is that I right, do. Senator Feinstein? Um, I will not make the statement, <laughs> but um, I think people could guess what's probably okay. in it. Yeah, so um, I okay. want to just say congratulations to all of us. Thank all you. All right. Well, thank you for your statement. It'll be admitted to the record. Um, I also wanted to note, are there any other statements before we vote on the manager's amendment? Um, Senator McConnell <coughs> kindly mentioned the um, Republicans on the bipartisan group, and we have mentioned uh, Senator uh, Manchin as well as Senator Warner, who's here with us. I also wanted to mention um, Senator Shaheen, Cinema, Coons, Murphy, and Cardin, uh, who were also part of the group. Um, so with that, uh, recognizing the presence of a quorum, uh, we will now proceed to a vote. Uh, the question is first on the adoption of the manager's amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. Okay, the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the manager's amendment is agreed to. Are there any further amendments to the bill? Okay, seeing none, um, we are now going to vote uh, with a quorum present. At least 10 members are present um, be on the um, bill before us. Uh, the question is on reporting S4573, the Electoral Count Reform and Presidential Transition Improvement Act as amendment favorably to the Senate, and the clerk will call the roll. Senator Feinstein. Aye. Senator Schumer. Senator Warner. Aye. Senator Leahy. Aye. Senator King. Aye. Senator Merkley. Senator Padilla. Aye. Senator Ossoff. Aye. Senator Blunt. Votes aye. Senator McConnell. Aye. Senator Shelby. Aye. Senator Cruz. No. Senator Capito. Aye. Senator Wicker. Aye. Senator Fisher. Aye. Senator Hyde Smith. Aye. Senator Haggerty. Chairwoman Klobuchar. Aye. Um, I also want to note, um, when you finish, I'll let the clerk finish for the two members who couldn't be here. 
the eyes are 14 and the nose are one. Very good. And although they, though they could not be here, I have proxies for Senators Merkley and Schumer. And uh, for the information of the committee, this is how our committee rules work, uh, they have asked me to announce that they would have voted aye. Um, and on behalf of Senator Merkley, I ask unanimous consent to enter a statement from him into the record. Okay, so be it. All right. So the bill will be favorably reported as amended. Um, and I want to thank, um, do you have any other votes you want to announce, Senator Blunt? Okay, I want to um, thank Ranking Member Blunt, Collins Mansion, the group, truly a bipartisan process. Um, this is a big deal that we got this done with a strong vote. I think everyone knows that. And we want to thank um, lawyers on both sides of the aisle uh, who uh, helped us to get to this point. Uh, the work of staff, and before we leave, I want to take a moment to acknowledge one of my staff members who worked on this bill, uh, Tommy Walker, um, our policy director for the Rules Committee. He's a graduate of Carleton College in Minnesota. He first joined my office seven years ago in 2015, uh, handling mm -hmm. my work on the Commerce Committee. Uh, he went on to work on the campaign side, came back, and has been with the committee for the last couple of years, both in the majority and the minority. Uh, he was here on January 6th um, in the Capitol uh, with me, and we are going to miss him tremendously. He's going on to a great job with the Small Business Administration, and we're very proud of him. And I ask my colleagues uh, to join me in thanking Tommy for his service. Senator Blunt. Well, thank you, Chair, and I think the uh, vote on the committee and the effort put together by this bipartisan group all indicate uh, the reason this needs to go to the floor and needs to get passed uh, this year, and uh, we'll move into next year with uh, this done, and it'll be a helpful addition to the process. Thanks for your leadership. All right. Well, thank you, Senator Blunt. Thank you, everyone. The committee's adjourned.